God welcomes all strangers and friends. God's love is strong and it never ends. God welcomes all strangers and friends. God's love is strong and it never ends. Well, good morning, y'all. I've got, let's see, I've got Riley and Clara and Harrison and Carter and Nora. Hi. What's and Emma. And Emma, welcome, welcome, welcome. We are gathered here around the baptismal font to start worship this morning. You may have noticed a couple of things are going on here at Edgewood this morning. First, we have some guests who are back with us. Our friends from Second Presbyterian are here again, which is really fun and exciting. And the choir is going to knock our socks off today. And the other thing is I have noticed that some of you are wearing your backpacks. Some of you have your backpacks back in the pews. Some of us forgot our backpacks, but that's okay. At the end of the service today, when you come up, for, uh, come up on the steps at the end, we're going to do a blessing of those backpacks, and it's going to be fun, and I have a surprise. There's something really weird inside my backpack, so that'll be kind of fun. All right, you know what we do. I'm going to read some scripture and pour some water into the baptismal font, and then we're going to start worship. And this morning, worship's going to start with Miss Amanda and Sophia over there making some beautiful music to get us started. Are you ready? Okay. Ready. The choir's ready. The prophet Isaiah writes, Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. 
Well, amen to that. Friends, grace to you and peace and welcome to worship here in this joint service of Second Presbyterian Church and Edgewood Presbyterian Church on the 11th Sunday after Pentecost. Special welcome to any of you who are watching at home on Zoom. You are here with us as well. We give thanks to God this morning for two congregations coming together who have spent years and years, over two centuries, nearly two and a half centuries combined, serving Christ in the world through loving our neighbors. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Three brief worship notes for y'all, uh, particularly for those uh, coming from second. We always have copies, paper copies of the sermon available each Sunday, at least each Sunday that I'm preaching. And so um, if you would like one of those, we know for some folks, it makes it easier if you have trouble hearing or if you just have trouble focusing or if you'd like to take notes. Uh, Don Hagen is at the back of the sanctuary. He's our uh, usher back there. And if you would like a copy of the sermon, you can usually grab it on the way in. But if you raise your hand right now, Don will bring one to you. The way we've been doing the prayers of the people, uh, joys and concerns since COVID is via texting. And I know that's not convenient for everybody and we're going to be working on that, I think. But there's information in the back of your worship folder about how to do that. There's a phone number you can send messages to. There's also a QR code if you really want to get fancy. And if you're watching at home on Zoom, that information is on the website as well. And finally, for the Edgewood folks, we're making a switch, sort of mid-August is an odd time to do it, but we're making a switch in the Gloria that follows the prayer of confession. It's one that's very familiar to y'all, but we haven't done it in a while, so I wanted to call that out. Friends, it is a joyful, wonderful thing for us to be gathered here together this morning. It is time for us to turn our, worship, our, our attention to the praise of Holy God. I invite you to now rise in body or spirit and join Catherine in the responsive call to worship. Good morning. Oh God, you tell us to ask, to search, and to knock. And, and the, the door, door will be opened, opened and we will find and we and will, will receive. receive. You tell us to enter through the narrow gate. For the road is hard and leads to life. You tell us not to store up treasures on earth, but in but heaven, heaven our heart will accompany our treasure. You tell us that the blessed are among us, the meek and the mourners and the merciful and those who make peace. You tell us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You tell us to put our fear aside, invite us to step forward in faith. We are gathered now as your people in this place with our hearts open to hear what you tell us today. Let's pray. Oh God, you have claimed us as your beloved children, clothing us with your grace. Give us dreams and visions of the nearness of your holy realm, where all are reconciled to live in peace and hope through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first hymn is number 463, How Firm a Foundation. Yeah. 
Please be seated. Friends, we have come here with burdens too great to bear alone. We have come here seeking authenticity and honesty and to join in the redemption of a groaning world. And so together we humbly offer our own truth to the God of everlasting love. Let us join our voices together now in this prayer confessing our brokenness. Almighty God, you know our hearts. You know how we struggle to follow the path of peace. Gathered together, help us to see your grace poured out in reckless and abundant love. May we know an emptying of all the burdens that we carry, of all the regrets that cling to us, May we know your love and forgiveness, a peace that passes understanding as you meet us here. Today, O oh God, may we be healed, restored, and forgiven. We now share with you in silence the burdens of our hearts. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. May the God of mercy who forgives us all our sins strengthen us in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep us in eternal life. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and restored to new life. Let's pray. God of all truth, we give you thanks that your word became flesh and now lives among us. As we prepare to hear the words, both ancient and new, enliven our hearts and minds to know afresh your living and eternal word, Jesus Christ, who is present in this place. Amen. 
Psalm 85 is a song that uh, asks for restoration and is confident that God will answer. So please join me in uh, reading these verses responsibly. This is Psalm 85, verses 8 through 13. Let me hear what the Lord will speak, for God will speak peace to the people, to God's faithful, to those who turn to the Lord in their hearts. Surely God's salvation is at hand for those who fear the Lord, that the glory of the Lord may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness will meet righteousness and peace will kiss, kiss each other. Faithfulness will spring up from the ground and righteousness will look down from the sky. The Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness walks before the Lord and will make a path for God's steps. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. This morning's gospel lesson comes right on the heels of the feeding of the 5,000, which was our text last week here at Edgewood. That miracle of loaves and fishes, we noted, that miracle comes immediately after Jesus and the community around him, right after they learn about the execution of John the Baptist by King Herod. The direct response to that empire-inflicted trauma was to share a meal with the disciples participating directly in the miraculous feeding. And Twelve baskets were collected, filled with leftover broken pieces of bread. And then this is what happens next. Listen for what the Spirit is saying to the church today. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after, <clears throat> and after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me! Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the gospel of Christ for the people of God. Praise to you, O Christ. It is really good to see y'all again. The last time we worshiped together five Sundays ago, I had more hair. You see, a few days after that worship service here at Edgewood, 
18 high schoolers from our Presbyterian BYG group gathered around a chair on a back porch in Montreat, North Carolina, and they passed around the clippers to shave my head. It was their reward for a week of good behavior and keeping their living spaces, I mean, more, more or less clean. Freshly shaved head, a few days after that, I found myself up to my ankles in the chilly waters of Lake Michigan. And I was being taunted by a 14 year old. You always take forever to get into the water, she said. Well, that's true, I replied, that's true, but that was before my head was shaved. You see, bald Joe marches confidently into the waves. Do not test a 14-year-old. Oh, yeah? Well, come on, then. Let's see. So I gulped as quietly as I could, and I turned to the horizon, and I started to take big, bounding, splashy steps. I focused on the sun, and I hummed the theme from Rocky. Dun, 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 dun. And once I was deep enough, dun, 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 I dove headlong under the icy surface. It was miserable. <laughs> but then it got better. And soon I was glad that I was spending the time swimming instead of working up the nerve to get into the lake. The big problem came the next day when I was dipping my toes in the water and I heard a call from the shore. Don't forget, bald Joe gets right in. So each day of the vacation, I had to do it again and again. I had inadvertently forced myself to be bold and cold. Some days it's easy to be bold. And some days, simply showing up is more than we can muster. Jesus, upon hearing of John's brutal death, tried to retreat to be alone. But huge crowds followed him in their despair and their need. And so, through the hands of his disciples, <clears throat> he mustered a, magnific a magnificent meal out of a pittance. Having dismissed the crowds, now, now, now he goes off to pray. He goes up the mountain to talk to God at dusk and into the dark night. Surely these are not his usual evening prayers after all that has happened. I imagine his first prayer might have been for John, giving thanks to God for John's witness and his life, his prophetic voice, his weird personality. These are the kinds of prayers that get dotted with great sobs from the throat and the occasional laugh from the depths of the tummy. These are the kinds of prayers that echo down the mountainside, tears and laughter mixed together. So he prayed for John, and then knowing Jesus as we do, we might guess, we might guess that his next prayer was for King Herod. And then maybe he prayed for his own anger. And then he prayed for wisdom and for his disciples and for the people that he had met, and for the ones that he hadn't met who needed healing and something to hope for. I imagine Jesus prayed for himself, that he would fulfill what John had said about him and not let himself be swayed at all by the empire. Jesus prayed on that mountain, and then he comes down in the murky early morning. Before dawn, the time when the only ones who are awake are the bakers, 
and the night shift workers and those who happen to be stuck on a boat battered by a storm all night long. He spots the disciples' boat, and Jesus takes the most direct route atop the sea. He's revealing truth in his steps. And that's something he normally doesn't do for the disciples alone. He sees them out there, afraid in the boat. And then they see him. Y'all, you're out on the water and it's been a terribly long night. And your leader has gone off praying on a mountain somewhere. And a prophet has been killed. And your eyes are heavy. Heavy from staying awake and battling this storm. And also heavy from having seen the unbelievable too many times to count. You are struggling to keep yourself together. Never mind this creaky boat. And now one of your friends spots a figure walking on the water. What now? Ghost, the cry goes. Jesus hears their screams. The water has been tormenting them, and now they fear spirits. Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. The thing that angels always have to say, Jesus shouts through the wind. And it's Peter. Of course it's Peter. Of course it's Peter who responds, if it's really you, order me to join you out there. Peter is my brother's name. And Peter has made mistakes. My brother, I mean. But he lives boldly. He lives boldly. And of this, I am deeply proud and perhaps even more deeply envious. Peter has made so many mistakes. The disciple, I mean. Peter follows Jesus boldly. Nobody can deny that. He's always ready with an idea. He's almost never right. Peter makes us cringe. He makes us roll our eyes a bit. We say, oh, Peter. We remember him for his worst moment denying that he knew Jesus. And we are all glad that our worst moment isn't printed on our name tag. Forget about four gospels. Peter is the teacher's pet, except rarely with the right answer. You teachers out there have had Peters in your classes. I know it's only been a few days, but you may have identified them already. Jesus looks at him and Jesus sees the fear from the night still in Peter, but also a flash of his bold desire to follow. Now, Jesus does not need Peter outside the boat. That is not a situation that Jesus, that Jesus has planned. Mark and John also tell this story of Jesus walking on the sea, but they don't include this Peter part, but it's the part that we remember. Matthew just can't resist telling us one more instance of Peter's wild heart outpacing every other bit of him. Order me out there. Well, come on then, Peter. Peter hoists himself onto the dark edge of the boat, and with the wind whipping and sweat and sea pouring down his brow, he swings his legs over the side of the boat, and for a moment, nobody breathes. Nothing has stopped. Everything has stopped. He puts his feet down, and he stands. Peter stands on the sea. Heavy eyes open wide in shock. Two men stand on swirling water. One, the confounding rabbi who heals and teaches and feeds the hungry from nearly nothing. And the other, Peter. 
He's moving toward Jesus. He is following in faith to the extreme. And then, like a certain cartoon coyote, in pursuit of a roadrunner 19 centuries later, Peter realizes what he's done, and he starts to fall. It turns out the storm did not cease just because he stepped out of the boat. Everything was still really and truly scary. The sea starts to swallow him, toes and ankles, knees and hips. Lord, save me. And Jesus pulls him up. I always hear this next part less as scolding and more like that person who has been coaching you to do something and they're watching you finally get it and then you panic and you bail out and they get frustrated. You, you stop pedaling and, and the bike wobbles. You lunge into a snowbank because you were skiing way too fast. You are having the time of your life with an amazing new friend or in a new relationship with a new love interest. And everything was going so well that you just had to sabotage it. With a wind-swept chuckle, after all the exhausting heartache of the last 12 hours, Jesus says, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? The two get in the boat and the storm halts. And then they know, the disciples know, they know you are the son of God. They know, they know forever and ever, and they never doubt it again. Preacher Barbara Brown Taylor imagines a version of this story in which Peter walks on water without any issue. And all the disciples pour out of the boat. They follow suit and they have a big party on top of the sea with their perfect faith. She says it might even be a better story than this one. The problem is, it wouldn't be a true story about us. The truth is that we are bold and courageous and filled with faith. Sometimes. And we are nervous little chipmunks. And we hide and we struggle to believe in ourselves, in our God, in anything good, sometimes. And most of the time, we're somewhere in the middle. The proposition that the life of faithfulness is all about coming to make a decision about Jesus, about choosing to believe, about standing or sinking, about a binary of faith or doubt, well, that's not based on any reality that we have experienced. <clears throat> What we know in our lives is much more complicated than that. It's got more depth. We are Peter, excited and ready to take the plunge. We are Peter, plunging uncontrollably to certain doom. But I don't think this story, even the version Matthew gives us, I don't think this story is really about Peter. I'm not completely convinced we're supposed to hear this tale and think, okay, so when we jump out of the boat, we can do better. I'm not certain that we are supposed to worry about getting out of the boat at all. Jesus sees us in our fear and finds the quick route to us. And even that makes us yelp until we recognize that it's a holy presence that has made itself known in our time of anxiety. We see Jesus taming the elements, unsinkable himself in the midst of the storm. Our God, since the swirl of creation, staying by our side when trouble surrounds. Jesus finding us as we grasp for something or someone to hold on to. He steps into the boat. And we know, even when we know that we will forget. It wasn't his idea for Peter to step out. That wasn't Jesus' plan for the morning. But he allows it. And he sees all of Peter in just a brief moment. All of Peter, the courage and the fear, the certainty and the doubt 
the boldness and the trepidation. Now I'm casting about, if only this gathered body of Second and Edgewood had some voyage ahead of us together that might require both audacious courage and honesty about what we fear. If only. Y'all, there are important conversations to be had within each congregation. Opportunities to offer to one another and to our God, to offer our grief, our regrets, our nightmares, our nagging, heart-tugging worries, chances to share meals when night is approaching and we have troubled spirits. Let us be truthful among those we love. Let us be truthful among those we love about what's going on in our heads and our hearts and our guts. Knowing that God is fully aware of all of it, our struggles, and God yearns to be with us in all of it. In the weeks and months ahead, much will be happening. At the end of August, Second Presbyterian Church will be celebrating the ministry of the Reverend Steve Jones and all that the incredible Libby has brought to that congregation. And Second will be worshiping faithfully straight through September and then holding a final worship service in their beloved sanctuary on the afternoon of October 1st. That happens to be my brother Peter's birthday. <laughs> That's funny. Second Prez, please know that through all of that, Edgewood will be holding you in deepest prayer. We will be showing up where we ought to, and we remain always a phone call away. Both congregations will be getting all sorts of ducks into all sorts of rows separately and together, continuing to ask the Spirit for guidance in navigating the course ahead. And while all this is going on, we will continue to do ministry, to care for our neighbors in justice, and to love our communities in peace. We will continue to have our own daily struggles and storms. And we must remain thankful that we are never in the boat alone, that the presence of Christ remains. So in the work ahead, the work that we know about and the life ahead that we're just starting to dream about, there will be moments for boldness and big risks for letting our hearts get ahead of us in the best way. And there will be moments for caution and naming fears and heaps of healthy doubt. No one moment encapsulates Second Presbyterian Church. No one moment encapsulates us as Edgewood, as Presbyterians, as Christians. No one moment. We are deeper than all that. We are so very blessed to know that God created us with such a depth. And we turn to this complex God and we ask God's help. We ask for God to help us delight in our boldness and to be gentle with ourselves in our fear. We pray for courage. We pray for discernment. And we pray for wisdom. Amen. Amen.
you my peace I give to you. Let us all now share a sign of the peace of Christ with one another. The peace of Christ be with you all. All right, a few brief announcements for the good of the community. Uh, please find the fellowship pads that are on the center aisle side of the pew. Uh, let us know you were here and how to be in touch and pass them to your neighbors so that they end up over by those stained glass windows and can be picked up after the service. I'll again remind you, you've got a few more minutes to send in any prayer requests, joys, or concerns. And we will share those toward the end of the service. After worship today, we have no Sunday school plans. It's August. We're still rocking for a couple more weeks. We do have uh, donuts and coffee outside. We hope you will join us for some fellowship time and just hang out for a little bit and get to know each other. We do need a team to head up to the kitchen, though, to prepare 40 lunches for Feed Your Neighbors. Uh, we do this every other Sunday, to, uh, and we, we send those along to one of the parks where they uh, feed hungry mouths. So we need some food, some friends upstairs to make sandwiches and pack those lunches. After everything has settled down a little bit today, Christian Nurture Committee does have a meeting, and we will meet down the hall in the front room there by the playground. Coming up on the Edgewood side, um, on August 27th, that's just two weeks from today, it's our kickoff of BYG. I mentioned that in the sermon. If you don't know, Presby BYG is a consortium of youth groups from five different churches. It's Edgewood, First Presbyterian, Cahaba Springs, Southminster, and Oakmont Chapel Presbyterian Church. Um, we gather every Sunday night during the school year, unless there's a holiday or something, uh, from five to seven, either at Southminster or here at Edgewood. And we have youth group stuff with a whole big group, and we have an absolute blast. Um, and they will not be given any clippers this on the seventh on Sunday the 27th. But that's our, our big kickoff, and it'll be down at Southminster. A couple of weeks later on Jan uh, January, my gosh, September 10th, um, Session has called for a congregational meeting, but it's a fun one. Uh, we're going to be upstairs in Barron Hall having a potluck and sort of have a state of the congregation meeting where you hear reports from our elders and you find out about all the cool ministry things that are happening. And in worship that Sunday, we'll be uh, commissioning our Sunday school teachers. We are still looking for a couple of communion stewards. Uh, if you would like to join in that rotation to help make communion happen, talk to me after worship. That would be great. And uh, folks from Second, I know there was a lot of chaos before worship, but we attempted to have uh, name tags for as many of you as we knew were coming, waiting outside in the hallway there. Um, so if you didn't get your name tag, please check and see if you have one, because I'm pretty sure we're going to be doing this again in a few weeks. And so we'd love to have a name tag for you. If there's a mistake on your name tag, just change it on there and put it back and we'll find those and fix them. If you would like a name tag and you don't see one for yourself, I want you to talk to Richard and Ginger. Richard and Ginger, raise your hands. They're right there. He's the big tall guy. Um, and they will make sure that we get a name tag for y'all. We're just trying to make it easier for everyone to get to know each other. Well, those are the announcements, friends. The ushers are about to come forward to receive the offering. I'll remind you that you can give online. There's information about that on the back of the worship folder. Um, and there's also an offering box at the back of the sanctuary. Let us gather our gifts together as an offering of gratitude and praise.
Friends, after the bread has been broken and the cup has been poured, I'll invite you to come down via the center aisle and tear a piece from the common loaf and then move to the stations where uh, the elders will have two cups for you. The blue cup has grape juice. The brown cup has wine. 
You can choose your cup, dip your bread into the cup, and then partake of the elements as you return to your seat by the side aisle. To your far right, our deacon Amy will have the gluten-free option for those who require that. And to the far left over by the windows, you can make your way to the uh, contact-free station if you prefer that. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. They will come from east and west and from north and south and sit at table in the kingdom of God. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and he gave it to them. And suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized him. When we gather at this table, we are seeking to recognize Christ's presence among us and Christ's presence in our neighbors and in ourselves. So come to this table. You are invited. This is not Edgewood's table. It's not Second's table. It's not the Presbyterian's table. This is Christ's table. You are invited. This feast is for you. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We give you thanks and praise, O Lord our God. You are our praise, our life, our joy. You are with us in stable and temple, river and hillside, cross and tomb, and even beyond the grave. When we have ignored you through the generations, you have sent prophets to speak your truth. And still today, O God, you call us to enter your realm of justice and peace. Therefore, we join with heavenly choirs and the faithful of every time and place as the people say, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, O God, and blessed is Jesus Christ, our Savior. He taught the habits of your holy realm, where the first are last, the greatest are least, and little children show the way of grace. Remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, O God, we take from your creation this bread and this cup, and we joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await the day of his coming. With thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be a living and holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your spirit, let your word be at work within us, calling us to welcome all as we proclaim to all your good news. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. And now with the boldness of the children of God, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, when the supper had ended, he took the cup, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving grace of our Lord until he comes. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Come now to the welcome table. Okay. 
ับเดี๋ยวก่อนเราเรา
As we continue in prayer, we add these prayers to the ones in our hearts. Shannon Busby asks us to pray for those involved in the Ukraine-Russian war and the leaders in charge. Anne Ray asks us to please pray for all the people of Hawaii, especially those on Maui and the Big Island. For these big, big things, we pray for God's comfort and peace. And for the things that are big to us, we pray for God's comfort and peace. Let us pray together now. Your response to Lord in your mercy, please, is hear our prayer. God of all kindness, you gave us your only son because you loved the world so much. We pray for the peace of the world. Move among us by your spirit. Break down barriers of fear, suspicion, and hatred. Heal our human family of its divisions and unite it in the bonds of justice and peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Oh God, we pray for our ever-expanding circle of community. Enrich our common life. Strengthen the forces of truth and goodness. Teach us to share prosperity, that those whose lives are impoverished may pass from need and despair to dignity, to dignity and joy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Oh God, we pray for those who are suffering. Surround them with your love. Support them with your strength. Console them with your comfort. Give them hope and courage beyond themselves. Use our hands and our feet and our hearts and our voices to bring your peace to our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Oh God, we pray for our families, for those whom we love. Protect them at home, support them in times of difficulty and anxiety, that they may grow together in mutual love and understanding and rest content in one another. Oh God, we pray for these two beloved congregations, for the ministries they do, for the people they love. We give you thanks as the God that we serve. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Oh God, we pray for the church. Keep us true to the gospel and responsive to the gifts and needs of life. Make known your saving power in Christ Jesus by the witness of our faith, our worship, and our life. We pray all this in the name of Christ, through your Holy Spirit. Amen.
I invite you to please be seated, except for the kids who can come up for the blessing of the backpacks and any adults who brought their backpack or their laptop case or their portfolio or whatever they've got, come on up. Riley's ready. Okay. Can you put a little of that one? The piggy in it. Oh my gosh. Oh, not a real piggy. Good. Come on and find a place. You can sit on the floor if you need to. There we go. We're all ready to go. Oh, there's a piggy in your bag. Oh, my goodness. So, y'all. Oh, here comes Amy, and here comes Miss Fran. What's that? Okay, well, yeah, that works. And here comes Buck. Oh, my gosh. Hey, Buck. And Emma, come on. Come have a seat. All right. Even if you didn't bring your backpack, come on up. Wow, look at this crowd. All right. We have been doing blessings of the backpacks here at Edgewood for a very long time. Now, Miss Fran over here usually does the blessing of the backpacks, but after nine years at Edgewood, she said, I think you're finally ready to do it yourself, Joe. So um, I am doing the blessing of the backpacks today. Now, if you grew up in this church, you know that Miss Fran shows up with her backpack every year and she pulls out something weird. First, she pretends that it's just pencils and, and paper and stuff. And then she always pulls out something weird and then explains how that is going to bless us for this year. I don't know if I want to do that. Let's see what's in my bag here. Um, I've got, let's see, I've got my keys. Those are very important. I need my keys. I carry my keys everywhere. Um, I have some scissors, some scissors. Uh, I'm going to put those right back away. I've got a pencil here. I've got some paper. I've got some post-it notes. Those are really important. Um, I even have a notebook here. Um, and let's see, I have my cell phone. Miss Elizabeth over here said she needs a cell phone. Oh, and I have my snorkel. Um, so do you all know what this is? It's a snorkel. I know I just said it, I guess. So this goes over your head and you press it to your face. Maybe I shouldn't do this whole children's sermon with the snorkel on. I was just being silly. That's right. With a snorkel, you can go underwater. If you are connected to an air tank, you can scuba dive. Or if you are up near the surface of the water, you can dive down and blow air out of here and see fishies and all sorts of things in lakes and oceans and uh, all sorts of beautiful places. And I have this snorkel from my days as a scuba diver, which I don't do very much anymore. But why did I bring a snorkel to church? Why, oh why? Well, our Bible story today was about Peter getting out of the boat when he saw Jesus walking on water. And he started to walk on the water when he was looking at Jesus. And then he got distracted. He stopped looking at what was important and he got scared and he started to sink. Now, that means a lot to me when the school year starts, because I think about the school year a lot. When you all start school, my whole life changes. The Edgewood Elementary over here, I have to change my traffic patterns. Everything's different when school starts. And when school starts, things can get hard. You know, there are days when it feels great, when it feels like you are walking on water. You are doing everything right. You're answering the questions. You get good grades on a test, maybe. You have good times with your friends. And there are days when it can feel like you're sinking, when you uh, have a really hard time, when you forget something. How, who has ever forgotten something and, and showed up for school without it? Yeah, it's a big problem, I know. Uh, when you forget something or you weren't ready for that test or something is confusing that the teacher says or someone's mean to you or you get into an argument with a friend or all sorts of other things happen that make it feel like you're just sinking. You come home at the end of the day and it feels like you're just about underwater. That's when the snorkel comes in. The snorkel helps me see underwater, 
helps me see underwater. And my favorite thing to do with a snorkel is to hang out on the surface of the water and have the water go just across the middle so I can see below the water and above the water. I always think that's kind of fun. And the water doesn't get in, and the water doesn't get in my eyes or in my ears. It's great. Um, so what I want us to be thinking about this year is how we can remember what's important because that's what happened to Peter. He forgot what was important and he started to sink. On those days when things are hard, when you have a rough day, when you have a rough time with a teacher or a friend, or you just have a rough time with yourself, I want you to remember the important things like you are so loved. You have a family that loves you. You have this church that loves you and God loves you all above all else. And that will help you even when it feels like you're sinking, to know that you're going to be okay. You can still see where you're going. You're going to be okay. And the school year will march on. Tomorrow will be another day. Does that make sense? I think so. I hope so. <laughs> so I brought my snorkel so that I can remember when I feel like I'm sinking, I'm still okay and God is in control. Will you all pray with me as we bless these backpacks? Let's pray. Dear God, Thank you for school. Thank you for teachers. Thank you for families. Thank you for libraries. Thank you for books. Thank you for math. Thank you for lunch. Thank you for learning. Be with us. All year long, help us remember, even when it feels like we might be sinking, that we are okay and we are loved. You love us and we love you. Amen. All right, I'm going to invite y'all with your backpacks to go ahead and stand up. And we'll ask the congregation to rise and body your spirit. Yes. All right. We're going to bless the congregation. And then y'all are going to follow me. We're going to march out while the choir sings. You ready? Friends, go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, and help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Hallelujah. Bye.